Welcome to FOSS North, the virtual edition. We would like to thank all our sponsors and partners in this difficult situation. Our gold sponsors, Luxoft and Ansible by Red Hat. Our silver sponsors, ITRS Group and Make It Right. Our base sponsors, our partner projects, the open source community and the region of Gothenburg. And a huge thanks to our awesome community. This would not have been possible without you. So for the next section, we're welcoming Elizabeth, who will talk about uh, differential privacy. Uh, this is a pre-recorded session, but Elizabeth will be available for Q&A afterwards. So here it goes. Hey, my name is Elizabeth Lavo. I'm a PhD student at Chalmers, and today I'll be talking about how to preserve users' privacy while sharing a statistical analysis of their data. This is a joint work with Alejandro Russo and Marco Gabuardi from Chalmers and Boston University. So we are constantly sharing personal information with companies, and they use it to learn about users' behavior, improve their services, and ultimately make some money. All this statistical analysis can be beneficial for society, but we don't want it to be at the expense of someone's privacy. In particular, we want to avoid people observing the statistics and being able to identify specific individuals in the data. This means all our statistics should be privacy preserving, which is especially useful for GDPR compliance since any information that can be used to identify an individual must be treated as sensitive data and then could not be shared or sell without the user's consent. Not ensuring privacy then restricts the uses of data and if not done carefully, might even get us fined. So there are two approaches to tackle this issue. One would be to protect the data when it's being collected and the other is to protect it when the analysis is being disclosed. During this talk, we will focus on this last scenario. So now let's take a look at a simple example. Let's say we want to know the percentage of males and females streaming this talk. This question could be very broad since hopefully we have thousands of viewers. Then an attacker may have a hard time identifying someone in particular. But this might not be the case if the question refers to a more narrow group of people. For instance, viewers from Gothenburg using X internet provider. So at the end, we would like all our analysis to be privacy preserving, no matter how detailed the question might be. Trying to protect um, users' privacy has been relevant, a relevant research topic for many years, and several techniques have been developed to try to solve this problem. One of these techniques is known as data anonymization, which basically removes all identifiers like names and social security numbers from the database before the analysis are performed. The idea is that since no identifying information is being used, there shouldn't be any breach of privacy. Unfortunately, this technique does not consider the impact of other external data that correlates with the analysis being shared and that could be used to de-anonymize the database. This is exactly what happened to Netflix when they published an anonymous data set as part of a contest to improve their rating algorithm. In just a few days, a group of people realized that there was some correlations between Netflix information and IMDb's review data. This was then used to de-anonymize Netflix data set, and of course, at the end, they had to pay for it. The statisticians have also been dealing with the problem of preserving privacy, and their approach consists on adding some noise to the results before publishing them. This way, they randomize their analysis, avoiding possible correlations with their data while still providing anonymity. Unfortunately, this technique is also broken, and it has been shown that it does not preserve privacy in the long term. Since an attacker with enough computational power can take several analyses from the same dataset and separate the noise from the real data, which will ultimately allow her to reconstruct the entire database. Among several entities, 
the U.S. Census Bureau realized that this was a problem with some of their published analyses, and they now advocate for a more refined approach called differential privacy. Then, what is differential privacy? It can be considered a more robust way of adding noise to your statistical analysis in order to better preserve the privacy. Let's say we have an SQL query, Q, that counts the number of employees with salaries above 60K, given a database D. A differentially private version of this query will be Q tilde that takes the same database D, executes Q, and obtain the real count, and finally adds some calibrated noise to it. In differential privacy, we pay special attention to the type of noise that we're adding, because we want to satisfy certain properties, which will distinguish this technique from just a naive randomization of the results. Intuitively, we want all our noisy queries to mask the membership of any user from the output. Let's say we have a database D1, with Alice's, Bob's, and Charlie's information. And then we create another database D2 without Bob. A differentially private query should ensure that by looking at its output, one should not be able to know which database was used for its execution. This means the distance between the results of executing the noisy query with D1 and executing it with D2 should be ideally close to zero. Since we're dealing with noise, we can't really talk about the specific points by a distribution of values. So to measure the distance between the two outputs, we look at their curves and see how far apart they are. To be epsilon differentially private, our noisy query needs to guarantee that the distance between the blue and red graph are at most epsilon. The bigger the epsilon, the further apart our results are allowed to be, and by extension, the least private. For this reason, epsilon is considered a quantification of the loss of privacy. So now that we have an intuition on how differential privacy works, how do we actually use this in real life? First, we consider two different roles. One is the data owner, and the other is the group of analysts that want to use the data. Analysts are not allowed to directly query the database. Instead, they send the queries to the data owner, which then executes them and give the result back. The owner sets a maximum privacy loss for the data, which we will call the global epsilon, and then she makes sure that it is preserved by all the provided analyses. However, each of these analyses has its own amount of privacy loss, or local epsilons. So now the question is, how can she enforce the global epsilon for all the analysis as a whole? Thankfully, differential privacy is a compositional property. So in order to calculate the total privacy loss of a set of queries, we can just add their local epsilons. Knowing this, the job of the data owner consists of checking the global epsilon uh, being greater than the total privacy loss of the given analysis. Now we can think of the global epsilon as a privacy budget and the local epsilons as the price the analysts pay to extract information from the database. As we can see, this limits the amount of queries that can be executed in database, avoiding the problems that the statisticians had before. Now that we have established how an analysis is performed, we would like to know how useful the results will be since we are adding noise to it. If we recall our previous example, we were interested in knowing the number of employees with the salary over 60K. In order to protect the privacy of the employees, our noisy algorithm will return a result around the actual count. Let's say the real count is five, so we might get results like three or seven. Now, of course, we as analysts don't know what the real answer is, so when we receive a 3 or a 7, how do we know if this information is useful? If the real count is, for instance, 100, then receiving a 3 means that we are just getting some random number. In this case, having a notion of how close we are to the real data without actually knowing what the real value is might become really handy. We describe this as the accuracy or utility of our solution. 
and it simply bounds how far can we be from the real value. A high accuracy means we are very close while a low one means we might be farther away and then we should probably discard the solution. When we consider this alongside with privacy, it is clear that one directly affects the other. Increasing privacy means adding more noise to the answer and therefore being less accurate and vice versa. So after this brief introduction to differential privacy, I hope you're eager to go and create your own privacy preserving queries. So for that, we have created Dipella. Dipella is an SQL-like language that allows you to create differentially private queries and reason about the trade-off between privacy and accuracy in a programmatic way. Let's just see how it works. So we have created Dipella as a library in Haskell. Haskell is a functional programming language. And if you're not familiar with it, don't worry, I will walk you through the notation during this demo. So let's say we are the analysts that want to compute the number of employees with uh, the salary over 60K. So it's the example that we have been talking to the entire uh, presentation. So we just need um, to create a query that takes an epsilon, um, a data set, and then we'll return, return the count. But we as analysts don't have access to the data set. So what we have access to is the schema of the data set. So this is what the analysts can see. And it is um, a description of the attributes of the employees table. It doesn't contain any sensitive data. It's just the structure of it. So in this case, we have a table employees with attributes containing the name, the last name, gender, social security number, and salary. Uh, you can ignore these or fu these functions below since they are going to be used just like um, auxiliary functions. So this is what we, that we as analysts have, uh, but this will be enough for us to create our query. So let's go back to our file. So what we have is just a function that takes an, any epsilon in a database. And first we filter the database, this one, uh, taking the attribute salary and taking all the values that are bigger than uh, 60,000. This one will return a filtered database and then we can perform a count um, that is epsilon differentially private uh, over this filtered database. Uh, we as analysts don't have access to the run function. If you remember, the only one al that is allowed to run queries is the data owner. So we will, we will want to send uh, this function to the data owner where we establish what will be the value of epsilon. So we have like three scenarios here. We have three analyses where we variate the value of epsilon, but we don't know yet the, the answer for this query. So before running, we would like to know the accuracy or let's say just the error uh, that we may get if we run this query in the database using each of these values of epsilon. Uh, we don't want to first run and then do an analysis over the error because that will um, we, we will be spending our epsilon, right? Uh, remember that we have certain epsilon that we can spend and uh, we will value this. So uh, Dipella have an operator called accuracy where you can just put your query, indicate what will be the value of your epsilon and then saying, run it in a symbolic data set. This symbolic data set is just the skeleton of a table that contains, uh, that has the structure of uh, the, um, the table, but we have uh, indicated we want to run our query in. But this symbolic data set doesn't contain any uh, data at all. 
So the accuracy is given, or let's say the error is calculated, calculated with a confidence uh, within a confidence interval. So this accuracy will return uh, the error of our um, query with a confidence of 90%. So we can run this, and this is not running in the database. This is just a statistical analysis that we perform over the queries that you have created. So this is the interpreter, and then we would like to know what would be the error of our query when the epsilon have value 0 0.5. So here we have an error of 5.9, uh, and um, oh, I mean, we, we don't know yet how good that is, right? Uh, but then we can check different values of epsilon, uh, like 0 0.5, 1, and 5. So, I'm oh, sorry, this will be error 2. So every time we increase the value of epsilon, it will, of course, decrease the error, right? Um, yeah, so... This would be just an information that would be super useful for the analyst to know beforehand, before actually running, because you can adjust uh, how much epsilon do you want to spend uh, in, in, in the analysis. So now uh, let's check how the running function will work. So let's go to the view of, sorry, the view of the data owner. So the data owner has a simpler task, task and uh, uh, the data owner just need to import the database schema, uh, the run function, and all the analysis that the analyst wants to run. So here we're gonna we're not gonna restrict the number of queries that the analyst um, want to perform, and we're just gonna run the three of those analyses that we just see. So when we run a salary one, what we're gonna do is like first we load our table that is saved as a comma separated value file, uh, and then we just return the value of running the first analysis over the database or the table that we have just load with uh, the epsilon that was indicated by the analyst. So let's do that. So I load this new module and then we just run salary one. So the value that we have obtained is five. And uh, here I just have, uh, I have an annotation where I say like we have 30 employees. So in this file, we have 30 employees and the real count is seven. So if you remember, the error for this analysis was within 5.9, let's say seven. So what it means is that this valuable that we have obtained, obtained varies uh, in the, it can be seven plus five or seven minus seven, between the, that range will be moving. So if we run it several times, you will see that this is actually the case, right? So this is obvious that the smaller the epsilon, the bigger the error, and we can see that while even running the queries. Uh, so if we run the query number two, this is the one with epsilon one, we obtain something closer to the real value. If you remember, the error was just two, so every time we run this, we're gonna see something around seven plus minus two. It's actually pretty close all the time, yeah. Nice, so even if we increase our epsilon more and more, so that will be the case when we run salary Number three, we will see that we get closer and closer 
because the error for this one was calculated at just 0.5 right so uh, this is how we uh, run the queries and uh, I mean the analyst just need to run one of these and return the value but if you remember we said that the analyst um, have a global budget in this case it will be this third argument that sorry yeah this third argument that i'm passing by uh, so it's 0 0.5 1 and 5 but this is exactly what the analysts want to spend so what happened if i reduce it like he wants to spend five and uh, i say no the global will be just two so in this case we want our system to reject this analysis and return an error since the analysis that we want to run doesn't satisfy the privacy laws that we want to enforce so we load it again and run salary 3 so it says that you have you don't have enough budget to execute the query and this will be the error that the um, data owner will return to the analyst and the analyst will lost uh, its uh, local epsilon so uh, let's keep it like here right so let's go back to the analyst part and we have know that uh, so now we have shown that you as an analyst can play a little bit with this trade-off between privacy and accuracy and since this is uh, a library in Haskell, you can create your own functions to optimize the selection of epsilon or uh, yeah, to adjust to a certain error that you want. And uh, this will, wouldn't cost you anything in terms of uh, privacy budget. Um, but now let's check how the system deals with composition. So if you remember, I said that if you have two uh, differential privacy queries, each one with epsilon one and epsilon two uh, guarantees, then composing these two analyses will be the sum of the two. So let's say that we want to perform the same query, the salary, the count of employees that have a salary over 60K, but now we wanna do it by gender and we want to return uh, the two counts in a list. So it will be a list with two values. So first we just filter the table in the salary part, in the salary uh, attribute uh, for those values that are over 60K. And then we create two different filters. One for the ones that check all the males that have a salary over 60K and another one that have all the females. Uh, then we perform the count for the two. But if you notice here, we have something called epsilon local so these are two different differentially private queries and each of those are using this value of epsilon local so now we have two analysis two analysis one with epsilon local 0 0.5 and another one with three we want to see what is the actual value of the whole analysis so it will be the actual uh, epsilon that computing these two counts will require so in the Pella we have an operator called budget that allows you to check the cost of your analysis before their execution so let's say we have we want to run the budget of running this query with an epsilon local of 0 0.5 so this we refer to Reloaded. So it will be cost four. And in this case, the sum of uh, 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 just give us one. And similarly, the cost of three and three give us six. But I mean, here we have, they are using the same one, but I can enforce something like a five and we can perform the same analysis again so the cost of four will be 5.5 uh, 5, and the cost of five 
will be eight. So this is just a simple overview of how Dipella works. Um, there are more analyses and more complicated analyses that you can do, but we wanted just to give you an overview of the type of uh, reasoning that you can perform when building your queries and um, estimating how your parameters should be set before execution. Thanks so much for your attention. And that's the end of the pre-recorded session from Elizabeth. So, so welcome to the live session. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, so we have. I, I think I can cluster the questions, and 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 we have two. Uh, the the one that we have two of is: uh, Is differential analysis getting any traction? Is it used among the big players, or or where is it used today? Oh yeah, of course. I mean, we have a lot of research in Google, Amazon, Microsoft Research. Actually, have another language for differential privacy. And I think I mentioned that the Census Bureau is also pushing it. So there are big companies uh, getting into it. Cool, interesting. And yeah. then the, the second question is, uh, what's the purpose of the analyst needing to write Haskell instead of SQL? <laughs> <laughs> well, we love Haskell. So <laughs> um, Haskell is uh, a strongly typed. And we use the fact that, I mean, we leverage on that type system to do the static analysis. So in particular, the accuracy part of the Pella is the novelty and is uh, our killer uh, feature. And we could only do it in Haskell because of the types. So that's basically the reason uh, why we use Haskell. Yep. Yep. Cool. Thank you very much. Uh, thank then you I have so to much. thank you for for your talk uh, and to all our viewers. And, and thank there you will for be the a... opportunity. And with that, I would like to thank our speakers, our sponsors, and all our viewers.